Hey guys, so my name is Varun Dainandan. I'm from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, same as Kyle. I'm here uh, just to talk to you a little bit about mate selection. Now I know many of you, my understanding here is that you're towards the end of your PhDs. Um, but uh, however, or the PG, okay, end of the PG, um, and you're working in plants. But hopefully I can convince some of you to come over to the animal side, or if not, you know, just, uh, just to show you that you know, animals are very important, of course, you know, when we're looking at pollinator, plant pollinator interactions, for example, looking at parasites and pathogens, a lot of these are animals, and so it is important for us to understand the whole, whole system. Um, if I'm going too fast, please don't hesitate, just like, throw something at me or raise your hand and let me know. And uh, without further ado, I will talk to you a little bit about, about what I am doing back home. So I'm working on background predation risk and mate selection in a little fish, an awesome fish, and I'll show you why it's an awesome fish, called the Trinidadian guppy. But first I'll talk, start talking about a little bit, well first I'll go over what I'm going to talk about, I guess that's the important part. So I'll start with the female mate choice, I'll move over to the five hypotheses about what female mate choice is. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about variation in female mate choice and why that's important. From there I'll talk about the costs and the trade-offs that are associated with females choosing a mate. I'll then talk about predation, which is my favorite part of the, the equation, it's my domain and my research interests. And then I'll talk a little bit about the main experiment that I've done back home. One of a number of experiments, but this one I think is the, the most interesting for now. So what is female mate choice? Well, female mate choice effectively is what leads to a lot of the things that you see here. Whether they be peacock with its feathers out, or peacock jumping spider with their dances, you're looking at a knolls, brown knolls, these bright red dewlaps that are, you know, just flashing about as they're looking for, for mates. Those are dung beetles. No one really thinks of dung beetles as having these nice, beautiful horns, but they do. And of course, human beings. If you go to a nightclub or something, or even just look around on the street, female mate choice is responsible for a lot of the things that we see in, in, our, in our lives, whether that be us as humans, as well as the animals. Um, and so there, there is male mate made choice, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, we're not all, you know, the guys aren't just stuck in a corner somewhere, we do things too, but female mate choice has led to a lot of the, the bright coloration and the behaviors that we see in the animal kingdom today. And uh, so the, the history of, of mate selection and mate choice is kind of a, an interesting one because it involves three very important figures. And so right on our left, of course, we have to start a talk with Charles Darwin. And he originally believed that the idea of mate choice and mate preference leading to those kind of beautiful structures that you see is something that's reserved only for the higher animals in the world. Now, his uh, companion with the theory of evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace, he believed that in fact there is no mate choice happening, that it is, there are other underlying processes, but that it is something reserved uniquely for humans and that we are the only ones that are able to see something that is aesthetically pleasing and make our decisions based on that. Now, of course, these two sides, the reason these guys are on the side and I have a nice bearded gentleman in the middle, this is R.A. Fisher, Ronald Fisher, and he was the first person to propose the idea that in fact mate selection and female mate selection is what led to the evolution of the complex structures that we see today. And these structures we call secondary sexual characteristics. So things like the peacock's feathers or the dung beetle's horns. And this, over time, this has developed into five major hypotheses as to why this actually occurs. Because we all want to know, well, why are, why are the girls choosing the guys that look different or act different or doing what they do? What's led to all these structures? So the first one is something known as the sexy sons hypothesis. And this is the idea that, in fact, females are choosing males that have certain characteristics because their offspring, their male offspring, will have the same characteristics. So the idea is that if, if a, a male and a female of, let's say, a fish species, have, a have children, the males will look more like those males, and the females will have a preference for males of that, uh, that kind of behavior or that coloration. And so this is an indirect effect, the reason being that it's actually going one generation down. The actual selection is occurring in order to make sure the next generation is the one that's prettier. This can lead to something known as a Fisherian runaway process. Fisher again, Ronald Fisher. Um, and this is, this is uh, the idea that over time you'll have this strong directional selection taking place because the males will all look like the, the male that this female chose and all their daughters will, will go and choose that male. So over time it'll really strongly um, select for those characteristics. And that leads to sexual dimorphism. Like why you know, the male peacock has the bright, t bright feathers and the female peacock tends to look very dark and brown and kind of more muted in coloration. The second hypothesis, hypothesis is known as the good genes hypothesis, and this is actually a direct effect. 
the idea here is that the male traits are honest signals of what the, uh, of the, the actual fitness of the male. So the female will choose the male based on those things such as blue coloration or big muscles or whatever they might be. And this is an honest signal of good, uh, of good genes. And so an honest signal, so I, I use this example you know, in people here because I think it's, it illustrates the example quite well, that an honest signal is something that you can really, as the word suggests, honestly tell what these fitness benefits are of, uh, of that trait. So if someone has big muscles, chances are it's an honest signal that they're strong. It's really hard to have big muscles without being strong. But if someone wears high heels, you know, it's supposed to mimic the idea of having you know, larger hips can carry a baby. But in reality, once those heels come off, that, that effect kind of disappears. So it's not really an honest signal anymore. And so this occurs with, with animals across the world. So when they're looking for, for these traits and these females are selecting these traits, they're looking for these honest signals. And this is the good genes hypothesis. The next one is the sensory bias hypothesis. And this is the idea that females generally will have their preference for something else. Maybe you know, a, a female will like the color blue, and the males will kind of over time start developing more blue coloration, not because it's actually showing that they're fitter, that their sons will be better, but rather just because they know that the girls like blue. So they'll start wearing blue. And so the actual, and this can occur from sounds like vocalizations, for example, it can uh, occur with pheromones and smells. So over time, they end up selecting for things that they just like in general. It might remind them of something that they eat, some food, some, but it's unrelated to the fitness of the male. The fourth hypothesis is the compatibility hypothesis, and this is the idea that the females are looking for complementary genes. We can see this actually with humans when we're looking at the major histocompatibility complex. And the idea here is that the, the females have some certain alleles while the males have other alleles. And together, their offspring will have a combination of these, of these genes, which actually gives them a much larger kind of best of both worlds scenario, where now they have immunity to multiple diseases and, and various other things. So we see this especially with immunity to, immunity to diseases. Um, and so that's the compatibility hypothesis. And lastly, what we have is the handicap hypothesis. And this was brought up uh, by a researcher in Israel way back when, but his idea was that males are actually developing these traits because they want to show that they can actually have this handicap and still be fit. So for example, the, uh, if, a, if a, a kind of weak and, and hurt and painful kind of whatever, this peacock is not doing too well, it can't have as long of a tail simply because proportionately the consequence of having that big tail is much higher for that small weak peacock than it would be if it was for a much larger peacock because a much larger peacock can have this and still get along you know with its day and get food and, and survive quite well so that's the, the handicap hypothesis now if things were all you know black and white and it was very easy we'd see more directional selection for these traits but we don't and the reason for that is because there's a lot of variation when it comes to female mate choice and the variation can occur across two major axes. The first one being choosiness. So some females are very, very choosy, which means that uh, they are willing to put way more effort into finding a mate that fits their exact criteria. It's how picky they are. Whereas on the other hand, they might also be, uh, have maybe more or less preference. So preference is the other axis. And the preference is what they consider to be attractive. So for example, Kyle might like the color blue, and I might like the color red, but it doesn't mean that red or blue are necessarily better. It just means that they're just two separate colors. So this can occur with female choice as well. So it's how they rank various traits and what they consider to be attractive. And so there's a lot of variation that occurs on these two, uh, these, these two major axes, and that is what leads to a lot of the variation in female mate choice that we see. And this, this variation occurs across all the major groups. So we can see it between populations, we can see it within populations, and we can also see it within individuals. So this can be across a day, it can be across a year, but the inter-individual variation is what we call behavior. It's one of, one of the types of, uh, of variation that we see. And so that's where I'm very interested in looking in, is, is specifically as an individual what that variation is. There are three major factors that, that can lead to uh, these, this kind of variation. There could be genetic factors. For example, this moth comes in two forms. The females are some white females. There are some yellow females. But in fact, they actually choose that the types of males they choose look completely different. And so there are, there's this kind of movement between the two populations based on this color. So we know there's a genetic component that is linked to their, their choices. We see in social factors as well, a number of things can, can also change how a female uh, will actually assess the situation. So the interaction between males, this is one of my favorite examples. So these birds right here, what they'll do is they'll actually get into groups of say four or five and they'll dance for the female, all of them, 
right? You know, yeah, you say you know what I'm talking about. Perfect. So they, they'll get into a group, uh, four or five, and what they'll do is they'll they'll all dance, and the female will actually look at all of them as they're dancing, but she will only mate with the leader. And so there's an interaction between the males when you're looking at leaders and followers. Um, and this and this is one of those ways that there is an interest. In, it introduces variation into the actual selection process. We can see um, variability in male phenotypes, like the widow birds and their very long tails. You can see one right at the bottom. There's female mate copying, and that's a very interesting one. We see this in lecking species, such as deer and antelope. Uh, they do this basically because the cost, and I'll talk about cost very shortly, um, of, of a female making these choices can be very high. And so sometimes it's just easier to follow what all your friends are doing and go choose the male that everyone else has chosen because the, the risks associated with choosing a mate are much lower. And so we, we see this with, with uh, lecking species especially. And operational sex ratio is another big one. So if there's a lot of different males in a population relative to the number of females, it means that there's a lot of choice. So the females can afford to be pickier because there's a lot of males near them. But if there's very few males around them, well, they can't be as picky simply because they don't have a lot of choice. And if they don't choose someone, well, their genes aren't gonna pass on to the next generation. And that is a, you know, a big loss when we're talking about things such as, uh, well, as you'll see a little later on, looking at natural selection and their genes continuing on to the next generation. Finally, environmental factors are a big one. So the time and energy cost of sampling, the, uh, the pied flycatchers will actually tend not to choose, um, choose males. I mean, they'll, they'll choose males, but when, they're, when it's very cold outside, they don't like to move a lot. I mean, I'm sure many of us can relate to that. So if there's a really, really pretty male, but he's all the way up in that corner, but then there's a kind of dull male, but he's over here, and it's very cold, they might just choose the close by male because choosing the one that's all the way in the corner is just way too energy intensive at that time. But that could change when, you know, temperatures change. We can look at territory and resource quality. These fiddler crabs will make these burrows and this is a big part of how females choose uh, exactly which male to mate with. Uh, signal detection discrimination, that's a huge one for conservation when we're looking at the building of cities and urban infrastructure. As you can see, you walk outside, it's so noisy, but in here it's nice and quiet, right? I, my, my voice is the only one in this room right now. But if I were to go outside, I'd be competing with all the cars, I'd be competing with all the other people shouting and yelling, you know, babies crying, who knows what. So that makes it a lot harder for others to hear me. So the same way we see this with um, actually these frogs, they, uh, they, they have to, they, they struggle to get themselves heard over the noise. And so when the males can't get themselves heard, the females will, will choose based on that, based on who they can hear. And so the, actually they, they, they'll start to choose differently based on the frequencies that they can hear. And some, some species we've seen even switch from say sound-based to visual-based um, uh, choice selection. And finally, we have predation risk. And so predation risk is a big one that does affect the way that the females can choose a mate. And that's because predation, getting eaten, has a pretty big cost, right? We don't want to get eaten by things. That's a very direct cost. But there's also indirect cost, and I'll talk about that a little later. So mate choice is very, very costly. The reason being that when you're searching for a mate, it takes time and energy. Again, if it's cold, we have you know, no energy. We'd rather just choose the one that's right there. Assessing a mate can also be very risky. You can have increased chance of getting a disease because you're coming into contact with lots of males. At the same time, you can be harassed just in the process. We see this with guppies, that males will harass females. It's why that mate choice copying exists for females because they minimize the cost of being harassed by many males. And then actually choosing the mate can be very costly as well. And the reason for that is that having you know, big coloration and making the choice and going through that process it can actually lead to being eaten because let's say a predator might, might see you a lot easier. We see this with fish. Uh, it also means that there's lost mating opportunities because once you make a choice, put all your energy and your time into one male, well you just put all your eggs into one basket and now what's gonna happen is if that male dies or if something happens, if those genes just don't happen to be good, well you're stuck with that. You spend all this time and you've lost all the other mating opportunities that you could have had. And so what we do see is that as the cost of mate choice increase, there is, uh, well, females become less choosy. We see this with, uh, with wild fish in, in areas or in populations where there's a lot of predators present. Uh, and this was probably initially due to predation on the bright males, and this led to a continued selection on these male traits through sexual selection uh, over time as these, uh, these brighter males were, uh, were being eaten, and we see this divergent uh, kind of process that occurs. And I'll show you that. That's really the, the crux of what I'm, what I'm taking a look at. 
So if we're talking about the actual effects of predation, predation can cause a lot of different variations. So they can either alter the female behavior, the females can lose certain behaviors, and they can even reverse their behaviors based on if they've actually occurred predators in the past. Now, I think this, this picture pretty much sums up this whole slide. You don't want to wind up like that bird, because that's not a very happy bird in this situation. Getting eaten sucks. No one wants to get eaten. So there are direct consumptive effects to being eaten, and that's the main, one of the big parts of being about predation. But there's also non-consumptive effects, so indirect effects of predation. So these, this possum on the bottom and this, uh, this frog that you see on the top, they're not dead, they're actually pretending to be dead. And that's one of the behavioral impacts of, uh, of predation or living in an area where there's a lot of predators. Um, essentially, you, you start shifting your behavior. But every time this frog is lying on his back like that, he's not mating with anyone, right? So he's losing out on mating opportunities, and this occurs to the whole population. And so these kind of behavioral changes when there's a predator around can lead to lost foraging opportunities and lost mating opportunities. And this leads us to the idea and the role of natural selection. Because if you always react like you're scared, well, you won't mate and then you won't have your genes continue on. And so you want to be that, you know, you don't want to be this, you want to be this dog. You don't want to be that dog. You know, you don't want to be afraid of everything around you because it's not going to end very well. You won't find food. Um, so you need so natural selection will favor individuals that can assess predation risk, and the responses need to be context appropriate. You know you need to react properly. We call this threat sensitive responses. Now in fish, this happens in two ways. We have disturbance skew on the left and alarm cue on the right. These images might give you a little bit of a clue as to exactly where they come from. Disturbance cues are essentially fish pee. Right? It doesn't really matter who peed. It all smells like pee. And this is actually released, um, it's non-species specific, so like I said, it does, we don't actually know who you know, urinated everywhere, but we do know that it could be an early warning signal. If you walk into a room and it smells like pee everywhere, chances are we gotta be worried because something happened. Maybe someone got scared, but we don't really know why, we don't know how big that, it, that someone was, we don't know anything about that. We just know that some, there was some, someone being scared in that room. Now this contrasts with alarm cues, and these are way, way more important. And the reason for that well, first they were they were introduced by Carl von Schreich, called Schreistoff, way back in 1941. So this is a, an interesting thing that's been looked at for a while now. Um, but essentially, okay, so what they are, they're these cells under the skin of fish that have this chemical. And this chemical is released whenever it gets damaged. So if something bites it, so if you're, you know, this unfortunate shark over here, and you get bitten by this shark over here, those cells will break and those chemicals will wind up in the water. Now over time, they're energetically cost, they're expensive to maintain, but the reason they've been maintained is because they serve to actually attract these guys. Because your hope is that maybe if this one, you know, those, those, those chemicals are released and this guy picks up on these chemicals, well, he's gonna come, he doesn't care about you, you're a small fish, there's no food there. He's gonna come and eat this guy. And while he's eating this guy, you can try to take off. So that's the idea behind having a alarm cue. And so it's, just, it's kind of been co-opted for this purpose. It's been also used by other individuals. So if you're, you know, the sibling of this guy, you'll actually end up uh, picking up on this, uh, on this smell and you'll realize, hey, you know, my sibling just got eaten. Whatever ate my sibling will probably want to eat me too, so I better take off. So alarm cues have a very, very strong response. And that brings me to the actual experiment, the main focus of my research. So what I wanted to look at was how mate choice within a lab setting is affected by uh, predation risk. And uh, I had three, three kind of major hypotheses, or, or predictions rather. One was that the, there would be a selection for duller males. Uh, two was the decisions would happen like this. If you're a female and you're in a, surrounded by predators, you want to make a choice fast. And you want to spend less time moving back and forth between predators. I did this in Trinidadian guppies. So you can see a female on the bottom and a male on the top. The male is very colorful compared to the female. And these are good models for this reason being that males will constantly be trying to mate with females, females will be mating with males, but they don't really care about them essentially for any more than a, a, a big ball of sperm. They don't get any other resources from the males. Um, they'll choose based on social cues and coloration. And we've actually seen in, uh, in previous work, we've seen both in wild populations actually, that, uh, that there is an impact of predation on the, the mate selection or the choice that the, uh, the, mate, the females make on, uh, on which male they take. So we know this is happening in the wild, but we don't know if this is really a specific reason or if it's some other reason that's linked to it. Uh, for the experiment itself, I set up a number of tanks. I had a bunch of females. They were the first generation born in a lab, which means their parents came from Wild River in Trinidad, whereas uh, these ones were, were their, their offspring. Um, they grew up, they were ready to have babies, put them all in, they were all pregnant, put them in these tanks, 
and uh, let them get used to that environment, after which I then started giving them two, well, three treatments. They either got alarm cue, disturbance cue, or control, which was just distilled water. They were also given a visual predator, a lure to scare them so that they didn't lose the idea that alarm cues and disturbance cues are related to predators. I needed to scare them too every time I gave them this, uh, this kind of cue. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially, yes, they were, they were given this, and then on the last day, for, they were given this for three days. On day four, I uh, put them in these, this little contraption over here. The female went in the middle while the male went on both sides. There was a dull male on one side, a blue male on the other side, and uh, this was all recorded. And so at first, the female was put inside a clear cylinder. There were two opaque barriers on either side, so they couldn't see the males. They got used to tank. Those barriers were removed. The female could see there's a pretty male over here. There's a dull male over here, but she's still stuck inside this tube. After five minutes, I took the tube out, and she could go and make her choice, right? Either this way or that way, and she moved around all over, she did her dance, et cetera, et cetera. Males were actually doing the dances. Um, this was all recorded with, with, uh, with GoPro Hero cameras, and uh, from there, I then actually looked at, basically reset the experiment, swapped the tank so there was no side bias, and then I watched her do the dance all over again. Uh, from there, I looked at a number of different traits. Uh, so body length and uh, both females and males were used just to make sure that they were more or less the same, coloration as well. I looked at the two male behaviors, the reason being that I wanted to make sure that the male behavior wasn't actually affecting the female choice, or if it was, I could use it as a, as a co-bearing factor. Uh, but I also then, the main things I was interested in was in the time until she made her first choice, the a number of times she sampled the males, uh, basically which, which male she chose, the bright one or the blue one, or the dull one, and her overall sexual activity. So how many times was she jumping around between the males? Basically, how often was she around a male? And this was all analyzed in Boris, which is a really cool free software for analyzing behavior. So if you're into free software, definitely check that out. Um, and then uh, ImageJ, of course, and, uh, and Photoshop, actually. And so overall, what I found was that when we looked at time until first choice, there was not really any difference between giving them a disturbance cue or an alarm cue. Uh, same thing occurred with um, the preferred choice, but what was interesting was that they sampled they, differently based on if they were given a lower risk versus a higher risk, and uh, they actually had different sexual activity when they were depending on what they were given. So this was depending on the threat level. So disturbance cue, remember, lower threat, just P. Alarm cue, a lot scarier, much higher threat. So it seems like, from what I can see, the uh, when they have a lot of threat around them, a lot of possible predation, they essentially. Um, were, uh, they, did, just, they, didn't, they didn't change their behavior. They just looked for, uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the mating opportunities. They didn't care what was happening, if they get eaten, who knows, but the main goal was just mate and then figure it out after. But in the lower threat, that was not the case. So this may be because, again, of those lot, they, they don't want to lose those mating opportunities. Uh, when there's a lot of predators, it's better just to mate, get out, even if you get eaten. Um, it could also be the ability of Weber's law, so having the predation around could actually make you uh, less likely, or less able to analyze the, the difference in coloration between the, the, the two males, you know, that stimuli is reduced. Um, and so that's something that I, I'm still looking into, I'm still analyzing, looking at the data, and so that's you know, one of the major experiments that I'm working on back home. And this matters for a number of reasons, it matters because of the, it could influence direction of sexual selection. Uh, and evolution, as well as the uh, give us a bit more information on genetic history, the evolutionary history of the organism, it allows us to look at some of the uh, the actual behavioral differences in the evolution of these characteristics, and also whether or not these these male traits, this dullness and this brightness, are actually robust um, as a as a species. And this is an example of maternal effects. And the reason I bring that up is because. Um, it's often not, not seen as such, but it is. So maternal effects are when the mother's phenotype affects the offspring. And uh, it goes along with offspring size and parental care, a number of things, and that's kind of the other half. I won't talk about that today, but that's the other half of the work that I'm doing. I'm looking at the babies of these scared mothers to see if there's any effect of predation on the behavior of the offspring. So I can also talk a little bit about that if you're curious, but um, really what I want to just mention is that, so I'm currently here on the Shaster Indo-Canadian uh, Fellowship, as well as a number of other fellowships. So, did a lot of grant writing, did a lot of scientific communication, chatting, and doing this kind of work. And so uh, if you guys have any questions about that, I'm here in India. The main goal is to meet with you guys, talk, collaborate, that kind of thing, really building these larger larger um, projects and programs and, and just that's and making sure it's a two-way interaction. Um, so if you have any questions on those kind of things too, grant writing or anything, uh, definitely you know, I'll put my information up there. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You can ask me now, you can ask me after this talk. 
I'm really open to that kind of stuff. Um, I'm doing some work here in India as well in the Western Ghats, um, looking at behavior and uh, genetics. And uh, yeah, so with that, I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Narasimhan, as well as Professor Ravindran, because that without them, that would, this would not be possible. I would not be in front of all of you. My supervisors, both here and back home, my lab mates, my family, you can never forget to thank your family. Um, and then, of course, the undergraduate students that I was really, honestly, like thrilled to have with me. Without them, it would be impossible to do the work that I've done. Uh, they are phenomenal, and I really, you know, they're all they're all doing great things now. So it's been it's been a wild ride with these undergrads. Uh, of course, our uh, our funding agencies between our, our federal government, the QCBS, which is a great consortium. I don't know if you have something like that here, but it's a, a big kind of collaborative group between researchers around different universities in Quebec. Uh, if you have one, definitely get involved in that. It, it makes a huge difference. Uh, Concordia University, provincial government, and of course the Shastri Indo Canadian Institute. Um, actually, in depth, I can talk more about the Shastri too a little bit, but essentially people can go from here to Canada and Canada here. So if you have some research ideas you want to do, definitely to take a look at them and the work that they're doing. It's really cool. Uh, yeah, so feel free to send me an email, follow me on Instagram, and check out my website. We do a lot of scientific communication stuff. I like talking about this stuff. As you can see, I like to keep talking. So, with that, thank you very much.